The ACE study involves 17,337 middle-aged Americans matching their current health status at average age 57 against 10 categories of adverse life experience in childhood and adolescence, experiences that are overwhelmingly unrecognized. They're kept as family secrets. We're all taught as children that nice people don't talk about certain things, etc. The study really began in 1985 when a young woman came in to join our obesity program. She weighed 408 pounds and asked us if we could help her with her problem. Our first mistake was in accepting her diagnosis of what the problem was. And so we said yes, and we took her into the program. We were and are using the technique of supplemented absolute fasting, which allows one to take a person's weight down safely and reliably by about 300 pounds in a year. I mean, it's extraordinary to hear that. Most people don't believe it. I had photographs that I had in my presentation uh, to illustrate what that looked like. So in 51 weeks, we took her from 408 to 132 pounds, and we thought, well, my God, we've got this problem, you know, licked. This is, <laughs> we're gonna have a world-famous Department of Preventive Medicine here. She stayed there for several weeks, and then did something I had not previously conceived to be physiologically possible, she regained 37 pounds in three weeks. And I remember asking her, you know, what's going on? And she said, I think I'm sleep eating. What do you mean? Well, when I go to bed at night, everything's clean and put away in the kitchen. I live alone. I wake up in the morning, pots and dishes are dirty, boxes and cans are open. Somebody's obviously been cooking and eating there. I'm the only person. Yeah, I have no recollection of any of this, but I used to be a sleepwalker when I was a kid. I guess that's what's happening. Okay, but, but why now? And after several attempts on her part to deny any awareness of why now, she finally acknowledged that it began the day someone at work sexually propositioned her. Hey, you look pretty good. You lost all that weight, Patty. How about you and me making it every week? And that was the day the sleep eating began. And I remember thinking, well, it's a pretty clumsy proposition, but I mean, this is 1986. It is Southern California. It's kind of an extreme response. Why the extreme response? And pursuing that led to a lengthy incest history with her grandfather. That lowered my threshold for childhood sexual abuse, which I certainly believed occurred, but assumed was rare. And as I began to find more cases in the obesity program, I was struck, you know, I mean, this, this can't be true. It seemed every other person I was asking was acknowledging such a history. You know, I mean, people would know if this were true. Somebody would have told me in medical school, I mean, wasn't that what it was for? And ultimately, 186 patients later, I realized that nobody wanted to know this, but it was real. But still, I, I asked five colleagues to interview the next consecutive 100 people coming into the program. And they turned up the same thing. Presented this at a national obesity meeting in Atlanta was attacked by the audience, who essentially said that I was naive to believe these stories the patients were saying. One guy got up and said that it was well known that these were just fabrications to provide a cover explanation for failed lives. Yeah, right. I mean, we all know we falsely claim incest for social aggrandizement. There was a dinner meeting for speakers 
And that night, seated next to me was somebody from the CDC, and he said, look, you know, if what you're saying is true, it's got enormous importance for the country as well as the practice of medicine, but nobody's going to believe your 286 cases. What we need is a large epidemiologically sound study with thousands of people in it and from a general population. Okay, well, how, how many? And we settled on 26,000. I had an unusual department <laughs> a few miles from here where 58,000 adults a year come through for un unusually comprehensive medical evaluation. So we asked 26,000 if they would help us understand how events in childhood might affect adult health decades later. 71% agreed. We had a study cohort of 17,337 people, almost exactly half men, half women, average age 57, 80% white, including Hispanic, 10% black, 10% Asian, slightly less than 1% American Indian, 74% had been to college. This was, and everybody had high-end medical insurance. This was clearly a middle-class population. And what we discovered, looking at 10 categories of adverse life experience in childhood, was extraordinary. At every turn, we stumbled into something major that people did not know in general. The 10 categories that we studied were selected because of their prevalence in the obesity program. And the purpose of the ACE study was to see, do these exist in a general population? And if so, how does this play out decades later? 10 categories. Recurrent humiliation as a child. You are the stupidest kid I've ever seen. Or as a man told me recently, his father used to line the kids up and tell him, you kids ought to just be taken outside and shot. 11%. Heavy duty physical abuse, I don't mean spanking, I'm talking serious beating with fist sticks and other objects, 23%. Contact sexual abuse, not somebody flashing a kid. Contact sexual abuse, 28% for women, 16% for men, 22% average for the group overall. Major emotional neglect, 15%. Major physical neglect, 10%. Growing up in a home where mother was treated violently, 11%. Growing up in a home where someone was chronically depressed, <coughs> suicidal, or in the state hospital, 12%. Growing up in a home without both biological parents, 24%. And that was interesting because it became clear soon enough that if you're going to lose a parent, the least damaging way is by death, as long as that death is not a suicide because death at least provides the possibility for a supportive explanation. My mother would have cared for me if, my father would have protected me if. Most destructive was maternal abandonment. Mom split when we were three. And you think, you know, an animal in the woods loses its mother, it's not likely to survive more than a day or so. Most common was divorce. An amazingly unstudied subject, which has huge relevance to childhood onset obesity. And then the 10th category was growing up in a home where one of the members of your household was imprisoned during your childhood, 5%. So we created an ACE score that was the sum of the number of categories of adverse childhood experience. Not number of events, but number of categories. And the implications of this were extraordinary. 
in this clearly middle class population. 67% had an A score of one or higher. 11%, one in nine people, had an A score of five or more different categories. So what that means is every doctor in the country is going to be seeing two, maybe three, A score five or higher patients every day. They will, of course, be unrecognized because basically nobody brings this up on their own. And we've all been taught as children that nice people don't talk about certain things. And my God, you can't ask patients questions like that. Why, they'll be furious and nobody will tell you the truth anyway. Well, that turns out to be humbug. We have asked now in this one department 440,000 people over an eight year period. And if anybody was furious, somehow I never heard it. The significance of this is huge and plays out in a number of different ways, most of which we avoid thinking about or talking about or certainly asking about. For instance, a key finding was that at A score six or higher, there was a shortening of life expectancy of almost 20 years. Well, how does that come about? I mean, aren't kids resilient, et cetera? The answer is no. The most powerful relationship we saw was to suicide. An individual with a score six or higher was 4,600% more likely to attempt suicide than an individual at A score zero. And I remember the epidemiologists at the CDC telling me that those were numbers, the magnitude of which they run into once in a career. You know, you think you read the latest cancer scare of the week in the newspaper, something increases breast or prostate cancer by 30% and everyone goes nuts. And here we're talking 4,600%. And the pattern that we found again and again was that as the A score went up, the likelihood of various outcomes went up. The outcomes, some samples, some samples, obesity, alcoholism, heavy smoking, street drug use, major social malfunction like imprisonment, multiple bone fractures, heart disease, lung disease, liver disease, a whole range of autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis. Well, how, how do these occur? I mean, how does what happens to a little kid have a proportionate response to these disease states later in life? Well, there are three mechanisms involved. One is various coping devices. People eat to feel better. Sit down, have something to eat, you'll feel better. Well, many of us have a great need for feeling better. Many people discover that as they put on weight, that gets them a benefit. In women, it is sexually protective. We'll come back to our patient, Patty, in a moment. In women, it is sexually protective. Patty regained all of her weight in a shorter period of time. She was back over 400 pounds in a shorter period of time than it had taken to lose the weight. She then disappeared for 12 years. She came back, had bariatric surgery, and at a point where she had lost 94 pounds, 
which to me was not clearly visible. I mean, this sounds kind of extraordinary, but she was so big that 94 pounds was not yet an obvious reduction in, in volume. She became intractably suicidal, had five psychiatric hospitals in the ensuing year, and three courses of electroshock to gain control of the situation. And on a video clip that I had planned to show you, she specifically states that she had lost her protective barrier. My wall was crumbling. In men, very commonly, obesity is seen as physically protective. We had two men in the program in the early days, while we were still figuring all of this out, who were guards at the state prison downtown. They lost between 100 and 150 pounds each. They made no bones about it. They did not feel safe walking into the cell block regular size. They felt a lot better going in looking big as a refrigerator. You think of our expression, throwing your weight around. So we know this, we have some sense of this at some level, even though we don't like to think about it. Heavy smoking. Well, American Indians figured out the benefit of nicotine centuries ago. I mean, moss and oak leaves were not burned in the ceremonial peace pipe, it was tobacco leaves. And nicotine has been known for almost a century to have effective appetite suppressant, anti-anxiety activity, anger suppressant activity, and antidepressant activity. Not only that, but nicotine has those benefits in 15 or 20 seconds of inhalation. The risks are very real and major, but they're 15 or 20 years out I think most of us have some understanding that if the screws are on tight enough, you know, give me that pack of smokes now, I'll worry about 20 years from now next week when things have calmed down. Alcohol. Sit down, have a drink, relax. Nobody drinks to get cirrhosis. People drink because of the psychoactive benefits of alcohol that are immediate. The risks are real long term. Street drug use. Well, everybody's heard of crystal meth. Everybody knows of bad stuff. Nobody knows. I mean, this is interesting for physicians my age who ought to know this. Nobody seems to remember that the first successful antidepressant medication introduced for prescription use in the United States in 1940 was methamphetamine. Wow. And it held that position for approximately the next 18 years. But, but isn't it dangerous? Well, if you don't understand anything about dosage, yes, I mean, any medication can be dangerous. You know, two aspirins are generally safe, 30 are a suicidal dose. You know, triple your dose of digitalis, you'll be dead within a week. So isn't this interesting that this, that this street drug, crystal meth, is an effective antidepressant? Well, it's a lot easier to say my kid's on that damn crystal meth because there's a dealer on the next block than it is to say well, my kid's buying antidepressants on the street. Relationship to biomedical diseases, we're not gonna have really enough time to to go into. If you are interested in the details of this, email me. I'll give you my email address in a moment, and I'll send you a lengthy book chapter about the findings of the ACE study. The question is, what do you do with all of this? How, how can we deal with this on a population basis? And what's clear to me is that the low-hanging fruit here is that huge portion of the population 
that has grown up without any experience with supportive parenting themselves. Many of whom might do better if they only had an idea of what it looked like. Well, since we're talking about millions of people, how does one get that idea across to millions of people? Well, certainly not by books, not by lessons. How about storytelling? What if one were to develop for television broadcast a serial program, soap opera, if you will, that had woven into the storyline illustrations of what supportive parenting looks like and how it plays out decades later, contrasting that with illustrations of destructive parenting and how it plays out decades later. I believe if that were properly done, it would have a huge audience. You know, you think of the old Mr. Rogers show. I mean, millions of kids watch that every day. And what was that about? Well, what it was really about was supplying a kindly, supportive adult male for an hour a day into the lives of millions of kids who didn't have that in their regular life. So keep the idea in mind that one approach to this problem is not dealing with the issues after the fact. I mean, that's a great act of kindness. It's also enormously difficult. It also involves just nibbling at the edges of the problem, leaving untouched the vast bulk of the problem. Keep in mind the idea of using storytelling as a way of getting this information across to huge audiences in an acceptable and memorable manner. The American Indian Television Network might be a good network to think about developing a pilot for such a program. I'll stop here. I don't know where we are for time. We're good. Okay, fine. Well, let's go on to the second category then. So the first category, things like emphysema, things like obesity, things like drug use, things like alcoholism, those are coping mechanisms. They have short-term benefit, major long-term downside. The second category is biomedical disease. And this becomes suddenly very complicated. Let's take a look at cancer. We saw a very clear relationship of ACE score to cancer decades later in life. And our initial thought was, well, I mean, you know, you smoke three packs a day, of course you're gonna get lung cancer, et cetera. And that's true, but th that wasn't the explanation. That just covered a little piece of it. The bigger piece, and, and I had a, have a little story here to tell you, I had lunch about two months ago with a woman who is a retired United States federal judge. I mean, that, that's a big deal. She had the most horrific childhood I have ever heard, amongst other things, other than having a lengthy incest history with her father. Her father, as a little girl, used to bring her into saloons to sell her for sex to strangers. I had never heard of a father pimping his own daughter. Anyway, somehow she did not commit suicide. She did not become a mass murderer. Somehow she graduates high school, somehow gets the money together to go to college, graduates, somehow gets the money to go to law school, becomes a US federal judge. Right, so she's a big success, right? She's resilient, yeah, right. That simply illustrates the superficiality of the way we judge resilience. In other words, you know, you're earning a good living, you have some social position somewhere, oh, you must be doing well. She has had four different kinds of cancer, not relapses, four different kinds of cancer, 
and has multiple sclerosis and has lupus. Well, I mean, how do you get four different kinds of cancer? Well, we've known the answer for some time. We've just never put the pieces together. We all are forming cancer cells at a very low level every day. Our immune systems destroy them. We're never the wiser. Getting cancer then means either that the rate of production of these abnormal cells is markedly increased beyond the ability of our immune system to destroy them, or the function of our immune system is so suppressed that it can handle even the low level of background production. This is a big idea because in recent years, it has become clear that one of the effects of chronic major unrelieved stress is immune system suppression. And this can last for decades. So half a century later, you can see playing out something that occurred back in early childhood. Oh, wow, isn't that interesting? And that same process, immune system suppression, is the engine underneath the increased prevalence of autoimmune diseases, like multiple sclerosis, like lupus, like rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera. It's not the only cause of them, but it is a major cause of them. So we found the links to the second category to be quite powerful. There's a third category linking childhood events to adult disease states, and that is the category of epigenetics, the effect of environmental stress on gene function. This is very different from mutation. Genetic mutation involves making a structural change in a gene. Epigenetic effects are essentially putting an on-off switch on the gene. The structure of the gene remains intact. Its function is just turned off. We did not study epigenetics because in 1990, when Dr. Anda and I were putting together the A study, the word was hardly known. The field of epigenetics has increased explosively within the past two decades or so. You'll be hearing a great deal more about it in the future. But the point is that what happens to children, which is generally unrecognized because it's lost in time and then it's further protected by shame and by secrecy and by social taboos against exploring certain realms of human experience. What happens to children, overwhelmingly unrecognized, plays out powerfully decades later and turns out to be the main force underlying the 10 most common causes of death in the United States. So the relationship to suicide, which I know is of particular interest, is our most powerful relationship. The relationship to other factors was amazingly clear. As the A score went up, the likelihood of these various outcomes went up. And if you would like to read more about that, email me. My email address is vjfmdsdca, like San Diego, California, at mac.com, mac.com. And I'll email you a very interesting chapter summarizing all of this. I believe, sure, V as in Vincent, J as in Justice, F as in Feliti, MD as in Medical Doctor, SDCA as in San Diego, California, at mac.com, mac.com. Just, you know, ask for the book chapter and I'll, I'll send it to you. 
um, I surely wish you well in your efforts. What you're looking at is important and difficult and resisted. Let me close with this, the idea of resistance. In Kaiser Permanente, a huge organization, in San Diego alone, we have 600,000 member patients in this city. When we introduced into our general medical questionnaire these so-called trauma-oriented questions about childhood, a couple of years later, a mathematician from UCSD who had a startup data mining company that now is on the New York Stock Exchange came by and offered as a gift to do a 130,000 patient study, two and a half years throughput for my department to see whether adding these trauma-oriented questions had any demonstrable benefit. To my amazement and pleasure and embarrassment that I didn't think of doing this, he demonstrated that that coincided with a 35% reduction in doctor office visits in the next year compared to the year before for that group and an 11% reduction in emergency room visits. In a big organization, be it Kaiser Permanente or states, that relates to multi-billion dollar savings. In spite of that, it has gone untouched. The resistance to dealing with this information is huge, so be aware of that. It's one of the extra benefits of storytelling. It's a way of getting across something that's threatening in a more acceptable manner. I'll stop there. You have my email address if you want to ask questions. We'll have a chance here to do that, or you can email me. I'm fairly good at responding. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here with y'all. <laughs>